رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خير الحال ان شاء الله you know since we're going to be short on time uh, one thing that uh, i want to do today is introduce uh, the work that we are going to be covering and then the subject and the author and then maybe start it a little bit so i didn't i thought i grabbed enough copies but copies that were made for the mca Thursdays over there. So I have three copies. And I'd like you know, some of you to at least uh, have a copy of this. It's in Arabic and English. It is um, a hundred line poem on the life of the Prophet. And it is a, it is a work that was written uh, maybe 700 years ago. So over the next eight weeks, um, what we are going to be doing is trying to complete these 100 lines covering the life of the Prophet. Um, it is something that is, you know, should be beloved to every single one of us. Because uh, learning about the Prophet sallallahu makes everything else about him easy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, uh, knowing about the Messenger and following him as a condition of the completeness of our Iman. And the only way that we are able to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through following the Prophet sallallahu Now, following the Prophet sallallahu does not become something easy until you know about him. And you know the things that he had to go through in order for the message to you know, come to us the way that it has. So uh, one of the reasons, you know, when we're learning about the seal of the Prophet وسلم, it is just to you know, kind of look at the life of the Prophet وسلم, and really be thankful for the things that he had to go through that you and I, through it, are now saved from the fire. Right, and it's always very important for a person to know the life of the one that he loves. Right, you have to love the Prophet Sallallahu And you, you can't love somebody unless you know him. Right, and this has to be, you know, some knowledge has to be there. So the book or the work that we decided we're going to go through is this very, you know, humble 100 line poem on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is, when you look in you know, the seal of the Prophet and the works that are dedicated to it, you have works that are very long. You have works that are like chapters from the life of the Prophet And then you even, when it comes to the poems, you have this poem that's only a hundred lines. But you have other poems that are a thousand lines. You have other poems that are in between these two numbers. Right? Just talking about the life of the Prophet So, this is, for us, would be like the beginning step into learning about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Imam uh, that wrote this, the Nabi Al-Izz Al-Hanafi Rahimahullah, he wrote it with the intentions of, you know, this is the first step. You should know all of the main events of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that it inspires you to go and move on to the next step of actually, now, there are some parts where he you know, leaves it off as not, you know, he doesn't give enough information. So this is supposed to entice you to say, you know what, I have the framework, or I have like a view of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Now let me go and actually investigate these things. And then through that, you get introduced to the bigger works on Sirah. Um Alhamdulillah, the one that you guys have in front of you has been, you know, translated into English. It's very simple. They try to keep the, uh, you know, the sounding of it. Um, of it uh, in, in the English translation. For those of you that, that don't have this, you could actually uh, just type in the name of it on your phone. And I think the first link is the PDF link. Right. So the first link would be um, this. I don't know if the Arabic is there, or if it's just uh, you know, the way that this is. And uh, when we study the seal of the Prophet the entire time we are engaging in ibad. The entire time, one, there's, there's two types of worship that we're doing. There is the worship of seeking ilm, seeking knowledge. And this is from the best knowledge that a person can seek, to learn about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the act of just seeking knowledge, you're in ibad. And it is one of the greatest deeds that a person could do. To the point of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he says, that there is nothing greater than seeking knowledge, except the fara'i, except the things that have been made for the us. Prophet he tells us in an authentic hadith, he says, 
that talab uh, al-ilm raidat ala kulli muslim the seeking knowledge it is a fard upon every single muslim so seeking knowledge it is a form of ibadah through which that a person is closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever you know he tells us about the messengers sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you know ajma'in what he tells us about them is the ilm that they were given the wisdom that they were given right to show us the virtue of this thing then on top of that you have you know the ibadah of learning about the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam every time we say his name or we are learning about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we are engaging in an effort to get closer to him to understand who he was to understand his sunnah and then to follow him right? so we are uh, you know in, in a blessed gathering and just like for every single one of us one of the things that we should be doing on a regular basis is really revisiting the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us that he is the perfect example for us for the one that wants to remember allah and the one that is seeking the hereafter this is the perfect example so if you want to learn about the perfect example you have to learn about the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know how were his days how were his, his nights what were the major events in his life and so on right and the seerah some disclaimers when you compare it to you know other sciences that a person would learn there are some things in the seerah that are not as strict right, when you look at different sciences for example you know, this is mostly a like a history class so you're being told of events like this happened this day and this day and this day and this day some of the things that tell us about these things when it comes to the authenticity of them actually happening it might not be to the point where we know for a fact that this is happening imam ahmed rahimahullah he has a famous saying where they used to question him on you know why are you so strict on certain ahadith but when you tell us about the seerah or you tell us about the people that narrate the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so on why are you lax why are you so easy when it comes to it so when it comes to the seerah we go easy because the purpose of them is not to come to ibad right you don't look at the seerah and say the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did this and say from that there's worship that we have to do so because of that we don't have to be as stringent or as extreme on you know the criticism of the people that are telling us these things the other thing is the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it went through stages in how it was taught to the people the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what they considered the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was his ba'ats so they used to say we used to teach the maghazi of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like we used to teach um, our children the quran so they would view the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not necessarily in terms of dates but in terms of the battles of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you know after this battle a month after this battle three months after this battle in this battles so this is how they used to teach their children And then uh, you know the, the first seal of works that like we would know them as books on the entire life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are things that come you know 150 100 160 years after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most famous one uh, work of seal it is the seal of ibn ishaq and uh, the tahrib or the summary that was done by his student uh, ibn hisham right this is the earliest seal of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we have from then on you know it took on this kind of let us you know go through almost the daily lives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what did he do from month to month can you tell us how that goes right so this is like the transformation that he went through and as time passed away from uh, you know being closer to the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you would see a lot of other things being introduced into uh, the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to from that yes, there are works that are you know you have books like uh, the Rarin, um, the Sahih, you know, uh, like the authentic seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this would be done in like they would take the like for example the work of Ibn Kathir Ibn Kathir rahimahullah he has multiple works on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of it that he has he has a very big one today is printed in three volumes in english this is the entire life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam very detailed the english translation uh, is very horrible uh, i wouldn't recommend anyone to buy it 
Because when they were translating this work, what they decided to do was keep it just like Ibn Kathir wrote it in Arabic. And what Ibn Kathir would do in the work is he would give you like the chain to a claim that he's making. So he would tell you about, let's say, the Prophet ﷺ was born on this day. But he would say, I heard from so and so and so, so all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes 14, 15 things. And instead of removing this when they were translating it, this is inside of the work. So what you end up reading when you read this book, you open it, you know, available on Amazon. I think that the recent publication is like five volumes. So you would read it, half of the page is names. The bottom half is telling you, okay, it's actually what I want you to pay attention to. Right, but in Arabic, it's a very wonderful book. So someone would come, you know, the muhaddithin would come and they would look at this and they would say, you know, let us only take out the most authentic hadith that relate to the seal of the Prophet and now this five volume, three volume book gets reduced into maybe one and a half. These are the events that we know for a fact happened during the time of the Prophet and to the Prophet Moving on from there, Ibn Kathir also has like a very short book on the seerah of the Prophet titled Al-Fusul. Al-Fusul fi seerah al-Rasul. In this poem, the author was a student of Ibn Kathir. And he tells you that this is like a summary taken from that work, taken from like this is you know sections of the life of the Prophet sallallahu and the way that he goes through it is the same way that Ibn Kathir goes through in that very small work of his. Now, after that time, and especially closer to our times, you have you know books that are written not in like for people in ilm settings, but for people in the settings of want to read stories. I think every single one of us here has heard of the book, The Seal of Nafta. Have you heard of this book? Most likely all of us have it in our houses. This book is written uh, in the 70s. Right? And it was written with the intentions of how do we get the seal of the Prophet in a way that the modern people can actually open it and read it. But even now, that book is very hard to read. In those times, it was okay. Right, so you have other books that have been written on the life of the Prophet uh, You have you know, some books like you know, When the Moon Split, uh, Life and Times of the Prophet And then you also have like actual English works that have been written on the life of the Prophet like in our times. Um, one very good one. Is uh, of the Prophet written by you know some of our brothers in the UK. Very easy, written for people in like high school, college, for them to understand the seal of the Prophet. So this is you know obviously a field that the scholars have given time to, right? have dedicated um, their time into the events of the seal of the Prophet. If you look in you know the six books of Hadith, they'll have a section on some of the events that happened to the Prophet ﷺ. Towards the end of the book, to tell you, you know, this is the person that the Prophet ﷺ was. So this is the books that are, you know, read in this type of way, talking about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. You have other works that are more on the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, the famous one that we know today, the Shema'il ibn Mutazili, work that is written on like what did the Prophet ﷺ look like? What, how did he walk? What were the clothes that he would wear? How would he speak? How would he wake up? What would he, the type of um, like utensils that he would have? And so on. And this is not a work like that. This is the other type of work. But also those are you know, very good books for a person to read to get if you wanted you know, a picture of the Prophet ﷺ, you'd get it from reading the books of Shema'i. Now, any questions up to this point? What we are going to do is today we are going to go straight into the book. We're going to go straight or into the poem. Who has the three copies that I gave out? One, two. One. I want someone to read the Arabic for us and the English for us. Who wants to read the English? Obviously, there's only three of you. <laughs> you guys took the books, mashallah. <laughs> Alright, now everybody else is relieved. We didn't touch these things, so we don't have to read out loud. 
It is from this one mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was sent down. The other 99 are saved for the day of judgment. Allah also means the same thing. The most merciful. And the only difference is where does the restriction come in Allah? Some of the scholars they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only Allah to the believers. Allah is only Allah. This is like a special mercy that is only for the believers. Some scholars they say that it is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of the Right? Even on that day of judgment, only for the believers. So Ar Rahman, Allah is the most merciful to everything, to all of his creations. But for the believers, on top of this general mercy that is there, there is the mercy of Ar Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the believers is a rauf and he's a rahim. So from this they say this rahim it's only preserved for the believers. Whether we take it to mean both in the dunya and the akhir or only in the akhir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those that give him mercy. In the dunya and in the akhir. And then he automatically goes to Alhamdulillah al qadim al ba'di. This is Alhamdu. When you use it in the beginning, it's known as the Hamdala. Alhamd is the praise that you do because the essence of the thing that you are praising. It is impossible for you and I to give hamd to one another, to give praise to one another. Generally, when we praise one another, you praise me because of something that I can do for you, something that you have done for me. For example, if I come to you, I ask you, let me borrow something. Well, yes, many other things, and you let me borrow it. Because of this action of you letting me do something, like you've given me a favor, you've done me something, I praise you. And this praise is not known as alhamd. It's not known as giving hamd to somebody. The one that is known as hamd is the one that we do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply because He's Allah. Not because of the things that Allah has given us. Because He is who He is, we praise Him. Because Allah is Allah, we praise Him. This is again different, you know, than being thankful. Having shukr, which is also another form of praise. But this is the praise that you and I can do for one another. I can thank you for the way that you are. In terms of your mannerisms and your akhlaq, the way that you talk to me, the way that you deal with me, and so on. I'm praising you, like, I'm thanking you for you having these characteristics. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's four times when we do that. But when we talk about hand praising, simply because He is who He is, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then He says, Alhamdulillah al Qadim al Bari. Al Qadim here, in some uh, you know, form, like uh, the manuscripts of this, instead of Qadim, you bring the word Al Qadir. So Al Qadir al Bari, which both of them work here. Al-Qadim with the intentions, like with the meaning of the one that was there before anything else. There is nothing that came before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is Al-Qadim, like he is the first. Everything else comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Bari, the one that... When you look at the creation of man, like the way that we are created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ability of creating things, we know him as Al-Khaliq. And that is, Allah creates things. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashions a thing, right, when things are like the next stage of creation, things are made to look the, like the way that they would look, we say this is Al-Musawwir. And this is attribute the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second stage of creation. The third stage of creation of and, and also everything, it is when Allah, we know Him as al Bari, Like things are perfected in the way that they are. The way that the mountain is, the way that the sea is, the way that this planet of ours is, the way that you and I are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like perfected it. And that is what al Bari means here. And then after that, alhamdulillah, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began His 
Surah Al-Fatiha begins with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So the scholars, whenever they would write on whether it's in poem, in the, in the you know, poetry form, or whether it is in like just writing in a book, they would always begin with the Alhamdulillah, with the praise of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. After that, you move on, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do this whenever he would give the khutbah. And we know the beginning of the khutbah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, khutbah al-Hajjah would begin in, in the Alhamdulillah, Muhammad wa Nasa'in wa Sakhir, with the praise of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Then he says, ثُمَّ الصَّلَاتُهُ عَلَى الْمُخْتَابِ He says, then the salat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on al-mukhtar. The mukhtar is the chosen, which is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-mukhtar is not one of the names of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it is a description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not a name, is Names like Mustafa. Mustafa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him. And Salah, Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi, sallu wa tasliman. Allah tells us that Allah and the malaika send salawat on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or you who believe, send your salawat upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Question for everybody. This is the same from every level. It's the salah of Allah and the malaika and ours the same. No? What do you think? When we say, when Allah says, like here, He says, ثُمَّ صَلَاتُهُ عَلَى الْمُخْتَارِ He's talking about, like, let the salah of Allah be on, on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the salah of Allah on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What does it mean, or when the malaika do it, and when we do it, what are we saying? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. What are we saying? So, the best explanation of this was given by a scholar, and uh, in the explanation, he says these are three different types of salah that the Prophet is getting. He says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Send salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is him getting praised by Allah. So when Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Allah is praising the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then when the malaika say it, the malaika are making istighfar for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they are seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You and I, when we do it, when we say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, we are making dua for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are making dua for him. So every time a person says Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, in all of his forms, it's not the only way that we send salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one that we do the most is what we do in salah. Right? Uh, the, known as the salat al-Ibrahimiyyah. What we do when we are sitting down, we say, Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim, all the way to the end. This is how, this is the most common way. But there are so many ways of sending salawat upon the Prophet And uh, there is so much benefit that is found inside of it. Uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever says it to me one time, Allah will send salawat upon him ten times. This is something that we should be increasing in. One day a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to him and he said, how much when I make dua, what portion of it should I dedicate to salawat upon me? If I were to dedicate, you know, a quarter of the time of dua, for example, 10 minutes. You know, I don't think we said to make dua for 10 minutes. <laughs> it's an easier number to divide, a portion of it. So let's say we decide today, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to make dua. We're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our needs. If a person decides to do 25% of the time, that will be two minutes and a half, right? So he asked him, if I do that much, a quarter of the time of my dua is salawat upon him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, But if you add a little bit more, it'll be better. Then you said, what if I do half? But what if I do a third? So now you go from two and a half minutes to... 
That's good. But if you increase, if you add more to it, if I do half. So half of that 10 minutes, or 5 minutes, all we are saying is, Allah will study that for you. In the different forms that will come. And then the next 5 minutes, we'll make our dua. Allah said, add more, it'll be better. What if I do two thirds? Now you're looking at almost seven minutes, you're making dua. Allah said, it's good. But if you increase, it's even better. Then there's no other like good number to jump to from two thirds, except a complete thing. He said, what if I do my entire time of dua, those ten minutes, I do salawat. Prophet two things are going to happen. If the entire time you're sending salawat on the Prophet every single worry that you have, Allah is going to take care of it. Every single sin that you have, Allah is going to forgive you for it. All you have to do in that time of dua, send salawat upon the Prophet Allah will, all of the needs that you have, Really, if you look at this, our worries, what are they? Like, what are the things that worry us, things that keep us up at night? I'll use myself as an example. For me, being a father of young kids, like six, five, and 14 months, my biggest concern is, like the thing that worries me is, how are they going to be when they get older? Like, what's the situation that, like, Am I going to be able to raise them the way that they should be raised? Or are they going to come on the day of judgment and make me stand witness to the wrongs that I have done to them? Right? If this is my worry, sending salawat upon the Prophet Let's say my worry is I don't have enough wealth in this dunya. My worry is my job. My worry is my relationship with people, whether it's my wife, whether it's my family, whether it's the Muslims, whether it's the people that I see everywhere. I have, like, I worry about the relationship that I have with them. Or I worry about, I have so much stress from everything that I'm seeing all over the world. All I have to do, salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of this is going to be taken care of. The other side, this is from, from the things that are like dunya things. And things that are bothering you when it comes to the dunya, Allah will take care of it. The other thing that bothers us is our sins. You know, having to come in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sins that we have committed, this is something that is, like we are worried about it. Because we know how much sins we commit day and night. So what, this is a word, sending salawat gets rid of all of these. That there are more you know, advantages of a person making salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. But hopefully this is enough to encourage us to send salat, more salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Then he says, وَبَعْدُ هَا كَسِيلَةَ الرَّسُولِ After this, وَبَعْدُ As we know, it's used when you are going from like one topic to another topic. You're sending praise on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Now, here's what I want you to actually know. Here's what we are going to be talking about from now on. So then he says, Ha kasirat al This in front of you is the seal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Page it. Page it. Now, seerah, linguistically, it means like a path. Like seerah in like the Arabic language, it means a path. But today, you know, the shari meaning of it has completely taken it over to mean the life of the Messenger Even though, technically, like, we would be correct if, let's say, this class was on the life of the Prophet of the life of Bukhara Siddiq We would be studying the seerah of Bukhara Siddiq But when you mention the word seerah, no one is going to think anything outside of the life of the Messenger so the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ is what's going to be covered here. Al Rasul, the Messenger of Allah. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, generally, when we speak in English, we refer to him as the Prophet. 
Generally, when we speak in Arabic, we refer to him as a Rasul, the Messenger. There is a difference between these two. Prophets of Allah are people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to give wahi to. They're given wahi with no responsibility of changing what they were given to other people. Right? A messenger is not only given the wahi, but there is a responsibility upon them to actually go and deliver the message. They have to go and take a message to the people. If you look inside of the Quran, how many prophets are mentioned? Three. So 25 by name, and two others by, not by their name, but we know that they're prophets. These 25, every single one of them, they're prophets. But, all of them are messengers. Not all of them are messengers. For example, Adam alayhi salam, is he a prophet and a messenger or just a prophet? He's a prophet. There's no one for him to be sent to. Who is he going to go talk to? There's no one for him to, but he is a prophet because he receives wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that would mean the first Rasul to be sent, the first messenger is who knows? The Prophet he tells us about the events of the day of judgment and how the believers are going to be, you know, going from different Prophets asking for them this, this this time that we're going to the prophets is the time that we have gotten tired of standing. We can no longer take the standing. And we say, let just let the accountability time of the day of judgment begin. Let it be time for us to be actually questioned. So the first we're going to go to Adam. Alayhi salam, he's our father, we all come from you. Go and intercede in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that the day of judgment could actually begin the judgment part of it. Then he would refuse. He would say, Go to Nuh alayhi salam, he was the first messenger. So, so out of the 25 that are mentioned, not every 20, not every single one of them is a messenger. But every single one of them is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the number, if we're looking for like a specific number. There are 313 messengers. And there are 124,000 prophets of Allah. In the Quran, when you would hear two names together, generally it means that one of them is a prophet, the other one is a messenger. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us about Dawood and Suleiman. Who's the prophet? I mean, who's the messenger and who's the prophet? The father, Dawood alayhi salam, is the messenger. Indication Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ زَبُورًا We gave him the Zabur. This is also one of the like things that distinguishes the, the prophets. That some of the messengers are given books, not every single one of them. For example, you find in the Quran, the uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's mentioned with four other people. You have Ibrahim, you have Lut, you have Samad, Ismail and Ishaq. Out of these four, Ismail and Lut and Ibrahim are messengers. Ishaq is a prophet. How do we know Ismail is a messenger? One, the Arabs, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, before prophethood, they would say, let us go back to the ways of Ismail and Ibrahim. The religion of Ismail and Ibrahim. Subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Wakruk fil kitab bi Ismail, in the Kana Sahaba Tawahi, wa Kana Rasul and Nabiya. He was a messenger and a prophet. I mentioned the story of uh, Ismail, so someone that would fulfill the oath, and then he was someone that was a messenger and a prophet. The Quran, we know that he was sent to a people, therefore he's a messenger. Let's go to the time of Zakaria. You have Zakaria, Yahya, and out of these, who is the messenger? Isa. Allah gave him the Injil and he had to go and convey the message. And generally, you have Musa and Harun. We know that Harun is the prophet. And 
place the message. So this is the difference uh, between a messenger and a prophet. And really, uh, for example, every single messenger, there's a period where they're only prophets. The Prophet ﷺ from the revelation of Iqra, he becomes a prophet. These are the first five, five verses revealed to him. At this point, he's a prophet. There's no command to do anything. Right? Like delivering the message. And the next revelation comes, Ya Get up and go over the people. And now his job as being the messenger. He says, This is a manduma. One of the beauties of uh, you know, Islamic knowledge, heritage that we have, is you can name any field that you want in Islamic sciences and say, I don't want to read the big books. I don't want to read works that are too long. Give me a poem. Give me something that is 100 lines, something that is 34 lines, something that is 60 lines. So I can get a picture of what this science is. In every single science, there's a norm that has been prepared. And one of the best ways of learning for anybody that wants to like expand their horizons when it comes to what they know about Islam, it is to get the beginner mandumat in every science and just memorize them. If you could do that, there is no question in any field of the Islamic sciences Except, guess what? You have a point of reference to go back to and say, this is what this is, like, this is where this fits into. So that's what Mulumats are, you know, used for in every single field. Any field you think of, there's Mulumat. And then, not only is there Mulumat, there's levels. There's the beginner level, there's the medium level, and then there's the high. Generally, the high ends at a thousand lines. When you get to a thousand lines, you are you memorize this, you have for example, if you wanted today, you said I want to learn about the science of hadith, or I want to learn about the sciences of fiqh or usul of fiqh. Each level they have their works. Like in the sciences of hadith, you have a work that is 34 lines. Known as Al Baykuniya. Al Baykuniya, 34 lines introducing you to the field of hadith. What does it mean when someone says it's authentic? What does it mean when someone says it's weak? Then you move from there, you say, I want something in the Sulu Fiqh. Not only in the Sulu Fiqh, but in this school's Sulu Fiqh. Let's say, for example, uh, one of the classes, the classes I teach now is Warqat, which is a very basic introduction to the field of Sul Fiqh. There's a Manduma for it. But let's say, you say, you know what? I belong to a particular Madhab. There's a Madhab that I follow. Out of the four. Every single Madhab has a Manduma dedicated to the three levels. <laughs> to the beginner, the middle, and the advanced. The advanced are going to be a thousand lines. And if you could memorize even the beginner one today, you would know more than the majority of the Muslims. In each of these fields, just memorize the beginner one. If you memorize the end of it, you are ready to you know, write those Islamic works and you know, actually make knowledge move forward. Right? And they would cover, like, especially the Mandumas in Fiqh, and they would tell you like in six lines of poetry, everything you need to know in Salah. You know how easier that becomes for you to turn around and teach your children. You ask you, what are the things that break your Salah? And you're like, oh yeah, from that poem, there are three things that break your Salah, or break your wudu, or break your fast, and it's there for you. But again, this is a work that is meant to be memorized. So Allah, hopefully it can be printed for the rest of you. And on this eight week journey of memorizing, it's two, eight weeks is Almost two months. Or it's two months. Every single day, you have two lines to memorize from here. Whether it's the English or Arabic, two lines. You have memorized 80 by the time this is over. And then you can do two more lines every day and you finish your work.
Then I will finish on Mawjooda uh, al-Fasuli. Al-Fasuli, the reason he brings it here is because the book that he's taking from, from the teacher in Kathir is known as al-Fasul, you see what al-Fasul. Mawjooda, it means like, it's, it's, it's intersections. So even in this poem, there's like different sections. And one last thing that I will say, when we cover the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, there are three periods of the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we concern ourselves with. The life before prophethood, the life in Mecca, and the life of Medina. The majority of the poem is dedicated to the life of Medina. The majority of the seal of works are dedicated to the times of the Prophet in Medina. In the times of Mecca and before prophethood, especially before prophethood, there wasn't anybody that was like really paying attention to Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Right, so there was nothing that stood out to him in the first 40 years of his life to where people were like, we need to, everything that he does, we have to write down. And then in the times of Mecca, there was not power to actually write it down. Right? So very few of those companions are able to share the story. But in Medina, you have the state, you have, like, you have people that are just dedicated to the Prophet So we have a lot more knowledge of his days in Medina. In that you know, ten years, and we do the rest of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Any questions? Well, may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala forgive us for shortcomings. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala have mercy on us. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala make this a beneficial way that we are getting closer to Him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.